when Boris Yeltsin was president of Russia in the 1990s, they were very clear about NATO expansion. And the whole time, the, for the three decades from then to now, people were saying, we can keep expanding NATO. They're never going to react. They're bluffing. So now we're at the point where they're actually threatening the use of nuclear weapons. And these very same people, these very same geniuses who got us into this mess in the first place saying, we don't have to worry about their bluffing. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm doing an update with James Carden, who is a journalist and was once an advisor to the US-Russia Bilateral Presidential Commission under President Obama. And he's currently a board member on the American Committee for US-Russia Accord. James recently wrote several articles that I think uh, deserve reading and, and discussing, especially about this uh, relentless uh, policy of the US and the West toward toward uh, Ukraine and Russia, which is getting us closer and closer to a potential nuclear exchange. And James also recently uh, was in Hungary in order to observe the European uh, Parliament elections from there. So that's what we want to talk about. James, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, Let's start with Hungary. I mean, you were there, you went to Europe in order to observe what was happening with the elections. Uh, how did you observe the mood in Hungary? And uh, Orban lost, uh, I mean, lost a bit of support from the last election. What's the interpretation there? Yeah, his party lost about, I think, about 10 percentage points uh, from the last election. But he lost those points, not to a left wing um, opponent, but to someone who was formerly a very close associate. Um, of his. Uh, so I think a fair reading of the public mood might be a little bit of exhaustion with him because he's been there for 14 years. Um, but I, in no way, I think, indicates a broader ideological uh, shift. People I spoke to are uh, tired of the war. They're tired of the sanctions. Um, but in that country, given its history, um, Putin, Zelensky, and Biden are all equally unpopular. The Hungarians have had their own issues with the treatment of the Hungarian minority in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, Russia isn't exactly uh, too popular there either. Some people felt that Orban was uh, a little bit too outspoken with regard to his views on, uh, on the war. But overall, the position, which is a pro-diplomatic position, not necessarily a pro-Russian position um, is uh, has some support. So um, his party took a little bit of a hit, um, but I would imagine that uh, he's in pretty good shape uh, otherwise. Yeah, and it's important to say these were EU Parliament elections. They have zero influence on the national politics, right? This is not uh, this is not going to change the Hungarian Parliament in any shape or form. It's more of a um, more of a bellwether. But that's that's correct at the same time and i think hungary if i'm not mistaken i could be um was unique this time around in that they were also holding um municipal elections uh right. there uh so anyway um so that's you know that's where we are i think that the overall results uh of the eu elections indicate um broad dissatisfaction with the transatlantic pro-war consensus. And I think that that is one of the issues um, that has led to their kind of um, popularity in Europe. Uh, the other issue, of course, being um, broad dissatisfaction with regard to migration. So, um, you know, those two issues, uh, war and migration, um, are really kind of driving the conversation um, in Europe generally. Yeah, and the we can see also in Germany how Germany uh, is pretty divided in the way that they that they voted between the former East German states and and West Germany. I mean, a lot of is now coming out, and France just uh, Mr. Macron announced that he would uh, he would dissolve Parliament, 
which is a really weird move unless one unless he just doesn't want to <laughs> to govern anymore with a majority and he's happier with like um letting uh, miss le pen coming in do you have any any um what's your interpretation of why macron now decided to to dissolve the french parliament which he didn't have to he didn't have to that's his choice yeah that is his choice i i think that your reading of it is is correct. It's certainly in France they have kind of a super presidency, right? The 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 government um, as it was um, the Fifth Republic as it was conceived under uh, Charles de Gaulle uh, in and around 1958-59 gives the president an enormous amount of power. So it doesn't affect Macron's position personally, but I think that um, it might actually be a pretty wise um, move on his part to let people. You know, have a, have a to give the pen and um, national rally a um, chance to see if they can actually govern, and it might end up being that um, when they're in power, they become uh, rather less popular. But I guess we'll see. Um, yeah. It's true. And, you know, they have, they have a word for that in France. When you have a president and a prime minister from two different parties, it's called cohabitation. And it basically, it doesn't really make the president a lame duck in the, sen in the sense that the US president becomes a lame duck when, when uh, uh, Congress is, is controlled by the other party. But because the president has more, more power than, than, than the prime minister in many respects, but it makes, it makes governing in general very, very difficult. And maybe that's the point, like having three more years and letting the Front National come in and then run against the wall. <laughs> and he himself is not up for re-election anyhow. Um... I, I think, I think, yeah, it could be that what crossed my mind when I heard that announcement was, uh, of course, it crossed my mind being an American, um, was what happened in the early 1990s in the United States, where Bill Clinton was uh, elected in 92, um, but with a minority uh, percentage of the, uh, of the of the popular vote. Uh, in 1994, Newt Gingrich and the Republicans came in, and that ended up being maybe the best thing to ever happen to the Clinton presidency, because after two years of Mr. Gingrich, uh, Bill Clinton triumphed two years later in 1996. Mm -hmm. Could be what that sort of thing could have been on Macron's mind. But of course, as you say, he's not up uh, to run again. So it could yeah. have been kind of hobble uh, uh, the Pen's chances. It's a risky um, proposition, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, it's a it's a gamble on his part. But what we can say from the EU parliamentary election is that the the parties in power, like across the board, a lot of them didn't didn't fare very well. So this is this is a lot of dissatisfaction from Europe, and maybe a lot of it I do think also has to do with with the war. And you wrote about that in three different pieces, which are going to be linked in the in the description. Um, how do you explain to yourself that right now when the war in Ukraine is definitely, ultimately, and unmistakably turning against Ukraine. And it's so plain obvious that Russia has having the upper hand that even mainstream media has been now reporting about this. Um, why is it that now the most um, belligerent rhetoric that we have heard from the US and also from France actually come out at this moment with like uh, the the okay to strike Russia's uh, heartland with with these um, missiles that NATO is provided with France talking about ground troops how do you make sense of that I can't um I, I I'm astonished that um now we are what um 28 months 29 months into the war that we ha might be entering its most dangerous phase because we're entering a phase where th there's a real possibility that it might become internationalized. It might become a global um, conflict. Um, I have been astonished by Macron's belligerent uh, rhetoric. I'm not that surprised by the belligerent rhetoric coming out of Washington, but it seems to be just markedly more reckless uh, than it than it had been up until a couple of months ago, um, when it became very clear that the tide 
of the war was turning in in Russia's favor. So I think that we're unfortunately entering a period um, of extreme uh, instability and indeed danger, especially if Biden takes the advice of um, the Republicans in the House. There's a person by the name of Michael McCall, who is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And McCall is calling for the uh, U.S. to allow Ukraine to strike even deeper in, into Russia. So um, what you have here in Washington is a, a real denial of reality. And it's, it is an extremely uh, dangerous one, given the fact, and this was one of the um, topics I tackled in a piece for the Quincy Institute, um, that the rhetoric coming out of Russia is equally insane. Um, you know, th th they they have been um, issuing uh, threats to use their atomic weapons um, on an almost weekly basis as of late. So um, I'm not, um, I, 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 I would have hoped a few months ago that we could be, that we would have been sitting here in the summer of 2024 with the election actually not too far away now. And we'd be talking about how this is winding up, but it, it doesn't seem to be winding. It doesn't seem to be winding up at all. It seems to be entering a new and more dangerous period. There are interpretations out there that this is the that this is the opening stage of actual negotiations that that might happen soon, and both sides trying to up the ante in order to to increase the threat level in order to have a better starting position for actual negotiations um, in, the, in the sense that both try to look, um, not both, like, especially the United States tries to look more unpredictable and therefore dangerous. On the on the Russian side, we have people like Karaganov and so on who have been very openly saying, we need to scare the Europeans and the Americans. They need to understand that this is real and that, that nuclear mutual annihilation is on the cards. I mean, there's the, there's those hawks, and apparently in the in the U in the U.S. we have we have this. I I don't hear that rhetoric. That's the thing from the U.S. I don't hear we need the rhetoric. We need to take nuclear annihilation serious. What I hear is like we don't need to worry about nuclear nuclear weapons. The Russians would never do it. As or therefore let's just strike them. They're bluffing anyhow. So um, especially Jeffrey Sachs has been very vocal in saying this is insanity. Uh, we need to take these threats serious. You are one of the people who said we need to take these threats seriously. Um, what do you think about these interpretations that this is like that this is maybe just an insane way of starting? negotiations? I, I think that's too clever by half. And I think it gives mm -hmm. people in Washington a little bit too much credit with regard to the idea that this is a bluff. We, we've we heard this all before. In the period between 2014, when this war actually began, and the main Russian invasion uh, of uh, February uh, 22, all of you that you heard, with the exception of like the, the the last two weeks before the Russians actually did go in and the Biden administration and the intelligence community were indicating and leaking to the papers that this is actually pretty serious. For, 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 for the entirety of those eight years, people were saying to people like us, no, the Russians will never invade you know, the Russians are bluffing. We can do what we like in Ukraine. They're never going to do it. Well, guess what? They did. Um, so I, I, I think this idea that, you know, we have this habit of not taking what they say at face value or, or, or even, or even seriously. And it, it, and it hasn't really worked out that well. Uh, you know, prior to 2014, uh, beginning when, Boris Yeltsin was president of Russia in the 1990s. They were very clear about NATO expansion. And the whole time, the, for the three decades from then to now, people were saying, we can keep expanding NATO. They're never going to react. They're bluffing. So 
now we're at the point where they're actually threatening the use of nuclear weapons. And these very same people, these very same geniuses who got us into this mess in the first place saying, we don't have to worry about their bluffing. It seems what to me, I mean, we're playing, we're playing, we're playing with fire. And I mean, the West is playing with fire and the Europeans also don't seem to take this seriously, which surprises me even more because it is utterly clear in the Cold War. And now too, the whole scenario is that before Moscow annihilates Washington and Washington, Moscow, it's going to be Paris, Berlin, Warsaw and so on that are going to burn. Right. This is this was very clear. Limited nuclear warfare would always be a European continental uh, nuclear war. And the Europeans this time around, they seem to be happy with that. They're like, yeah, let's do it. Can you well, they have, I mean, they don't have any. It's, it's a very similar situation politically to the situation here, and that they don't really have any people of any quality leading them. We certainly don't. And, you know, back in the, during the height of the Cold War, at the very least, you had people like President de Gaulle, who understood the fact that the United States in a nuclear exchange was never going to exchange New York or Washington for, for Berlin or Paris. Uh, that was the whole reason why um, he decided to go out and get his own uh, deterrent. So, you know, this, this, it's a very, 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 very dangerous, as you say, it's a very, very dangerous game that they're playing. And there seems to be a markedly, there seems to be a no interest uh, in, in a diplomatic uh, settlement outside of, someone like um you know victor orban um and the um prime minister of um slovenia who was recently um shot um these aren't exactly major figures uh of uh, 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 leading you know major powers i mean the, no. they're con they, they they're right of course but where the power is you see very, very little common sense on display. Yeah, uh, like close to nothing. The The one thing that's going to happen next weekend and that I am not excited about, but it's still going to be interesting to see how it plays out, is that weird peace summit in Switzerland, uh, which is not, you know, it's 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 stupidly named from the beginning. It's the fifth meeting of this Copenhagen format of basically just people pressuring the, the global community to like agree to Zelensky's uh, peace formula, which is a formula for a Russian surrender. Um, but but um, the interesting thing is that you're going to have a couple of participants that that don't fit that narrative, which one is uh, Hungary, who's going to be there. And I talked to Viktor Orban's political advisor, Balash Orban, and he said, "Look, we support anything that 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 might lead to peace in a, in a later stage, right? And this might be one. <laughs> we don't know, but it might lead to something. Uh, and we, the, an Indian delegation, is going to be there. And you know, if they want a, a, a joint communique at the end, then." There needs to be this needs to be toned down. I don't think the Indians or the Hungarians would put their signature under something that calls for an outright Russian surrender, ignoring all of the uh, all of all of the things that are actually have been happening on the battlefield over the last couple of months. Do you put so this is the the, the only hope I have that that some negotiation position that can be used later on to negotiate with the Russians will come out of this. Do you have any similar hopes or how do you see the, the that meeting next week? I just find the whole concept of a peace conference without both belligerents present to be sort of a puzzling concept. Yeah. Um, so no, I don't. I don't have any expectations that anything will come out of this that are meaningful. Um, it's going to be. It is going to be another international forum for Zelensky to do what Zelensky does, which is to hector the West um, and issue statements of moral blackmail and um, everyone will, you know, they'll, he'll get more money out of it, but the, sp the spiel we already know. Right. So no, yeah. I'm the, I have zero expectations for, for the, for the upcoming uh, conference. Yeah. Um, 
the at at the same time now you've also written about the <laughs> a State Department-linked Ukrainian NGO that's, that is creating another Ukrainian list of enemies of Ukraine. Uh, there's there's several ones of those out there already, and we know several ones that really were, that had people listed who then got crossed off as eliminated, like the daughter of, of uh, Mr. Dugin, uh, Madame Dugina. Uh, I, forgot, I forgot her whole, of her entire name, but that, that that's a different list. And now there's, there's yet another list that the Ukrainians created with Americans on it, that uh, yeah, that seems very very some. Could you explain? Could you tell us what that one is about? Yeah, I learned about it from a report from um, one of my colleagues uh, at the American Conservative, and it seems to me to be an, yet another one of these media lists where, um, and this has become this is sort of part of the new dis disinformation complex where they issue these um, these rather intricate websites where they link all sorts of people and it's all supposed to be kind of a conspiracy. Uh, we're all, you know, I think that there are hundreds of names on this thing. And, um, you know, I guess we're all supposed to be in cahoots taking orders from the Kremlin. I think that that's generally the idea. Um, you know, they, they issue these things every six months or so. Um, the list that you're talking about with um, uh, uh, Dugan's daughter um, was, I think, the very first one, um, and that that was a, that was even more alarming because this seems to be kind of like a media thing. That other list was like calling people terrorists and calling for their calling for their elimination. So. Um, you know, what what's really worrying to me is that if you dig a little bit into these things, eventually you'll find that the, there's funding for this stuff coming out of the West and usually from from the U.S. So, um, but that's become kind of the mo of uh, of the of the of the of these people. They they're not interested in uh, the any sort of debate what they're interested in is um, simply attacking the uh, character of, of their critics. But we've been dealing with this uh, for, for many, many years now. And um, it, it'll come to a fever pitch once, um, once it becomes even more clear that the Ukrainians are not going to get that land back, they're not going to win this war, and um, indeed, it, it could it it could go from from bad to worse. Um, what is interesting is that, and this has been widely ignored, but writers did report on it. Is that you know, um, Putin has through emissaries um, issued you know expressed interest in talks. But um, there seems to be no uh, reciprocation. He has, that. he has said so actually time and again, and he's even said what the basis of that could be. And that is actually the Istanbul Agreement. He said so about two weeks ago. Again, it's like, uh, it, of course, it would have to take into account the current realities. But Istanbul to him is not dead. That's uh, at least to my mind, pretty clear. He said so in the Tucker Carlson interview. He said so again two weeks ago. Um, and that is actually a very generous starting point, if you think about it, because the terms in there, as we now also know from an analysis from um, Sergei Rachenko and his colleague, um, have been like favorable. Of course, this would be the starting point and not the end. Um, but I, I don't understand. I, 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 I understand that the neocons in the United States won total victory. And nothing less, and they want to see Putin in uh, in 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 the Hague or dead, and Russia split up into fifteen successor states, <laughs> um, and they they are willing to to do whatever it takes to get there. But then there's there there must be more people in the U.S. who must be wanting to wind this war down, right? I mean, especially the Democrats. I mean, Ms. I mean Joe Biden's um, ratings are abysmal at the moment. And even the lawfare against Donald Trump isn't getting Trump out of the way. So I, isn't there an entire group that must be interested for practical reasons by now, for electoral reasons, 
um, to wind this down? I don't, you would hope, but I, I don't, I haven't seen that. Um, I don't think that that is, I think right now it's basically a, it's become more tribal. It's like, you know, you're either on the red team or the blue team and, and that's it. And um, I don't think this is going to be a rather issues heavy uh, election at all. I think it's really going to be a referendum on whether you stick with the one guy or you get the other guy back. And um, that's it. The one candidate who is talking about the war is is Kennedy, who is you know an extreme long shot, and it I think now is generally polling at about ten percent. Now he seems to be getting on a lot of ballots, um, but outside of that, and that's very very small. Um, no, I don't think that the war is on a lot of people's minds in the in the United States. To be perfectly honest. If you compare the the importance of the let's say the, the war in Ukraine versus the war against Gaza, uh, then um, which which one do you think is more impactful on voters' minds at the moment? Oh, Israel Gaza, no question about it. It's not even close on both sides, for and against. Um, the against um, side is going to cause, I think, Biden significant significant problems and with his uh with his re-election yeah um effort um so yeah no, I think once once that happened and i don't even know if there was i mean outside of maybe like you know february of 2022 and through maybe the summer that the the ukraine war had a lot of american attention but once october 7th happened forget about it I mean, it's all it's 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 Israel, Gaza, all the way. In in the event that that American voter does think about foreign policy, and actually there aren't really that many of them uh, to begin with. So it's a really bizarre moment because the 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 likelihood of Israel Gaza spiraling into a nuclear mushroom cloud over Washington is near zero, whereas the one the 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 Ukraine Russia war. I mean. There is a chance. I mean, these are Russia is the largest nuclear power. I mean, I, I don't I don't recall uh, who has more nuclear warheads, Russia or the US. I think it's Russia, actually, right? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> why is it that we are so bad? Like, as in humans, are so bad at at calculating risk? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I. <laughs> well, um, well, that's. That's the question. Um, and, you know, one of the things that one would hope or expect from the, the American leadership uh, class is simply an, a, an, an awareness um, of, of these risks. But they never seem to tire of really pushing the envelope and, 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 and taking insane risks. Of course, I think in large part because you know we are so we are so isolated uh we are yeah. so we are so remote and we haven't had the experience of fighting on our land since 1860 to 1861 1860 you know uh 5 so you know with the exception of the of Pearl Harbor, which was an, you know, attack in Hawaii, which is half a world away from everyone anyway. Um, and the attacks on 9-11, we haven't really uh, experienced it. So we're very remote. Um, and that's reflected in uh, the priorities of uh, the American, of, of the American elite. But it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's very foolish. And it is a departure from, and I mean, our kind of reckless saber rattling um, with regards to to Russia is it's it's a real departure from the way American presidents dealt with their Soviet counterparts yeah. during the Cold War. Uh, neither side, the leadership, of neither side wanted to have anything to do with with that. Um, and that has steadily eroded 
to the point now where everyone everyone here in town seems to think that um, the Russians are bluffing and it might be worth calling their bluff. I don't see it that way, but I'm a minority of a minority of a minority here. Yeah, um, the, the stakes the stakes are just incredibly high. This is um, I don't know. I've I've read I've read reports that I don't know how much I can I can trust them. That there's that there's talk between the Russians and Cubans of of Russia actually sending a couple of uh, ships there, like trying to kind of make the U.S. understand how dangerous this is by by. Uh, by by uh, approaching Cuba is do you know anything about that I I don't I only I just recall that I read something to to that extent but it seemed too too cr too weird to me too crazy to to think that the Russians would actually do that I I think I saw the same report but I I had the same impression that you you did I I um I, I uh, hope they're not serious. But yeah, I mean, if 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 there's a, if if there's a way to escalate this from their side, then it would be it would be trying to to pay back the U.S. with its own currency, which uh, which the, doesn't sit well with great powers. Doesn't sit well at all. Um, okay. Um, is there anything that you're looking out for this week in in international news that you think will have an impact on uh, on the immediate future? Uh, well, I think. Um, no, I, I am I am interested in seeing how um, the coalitions uh, within within Brussels emerge um, mm. because we have the um, EU Foreign Affairs Commissioner uh, Joseph Borrell. He's not, he's not coming back, so it's going to be interesting in the coming weeks to see uh, who replaces. Uh, him in that in that position, um, and some of the candidates. Are the uh, prime minister of Estonia is one of the candidates, and um, even even worse, uh, the Polish foreign minister uh, Radek Sikorski uh, is another apparently another uh, leading candidate. Um, so I think he would be from our perspective since we. Um, seem to care about the future of the planet um, and, you know, an end to the war would he probably be the very worst. Um, yeah, it seems, so it's yeah, it's, be... in, in order to be a candidate for this position, I think one of the requirements is that you have never ever uh, heard of the word diplomacy, nor can spell it, nor could like somehow meaningfully interact with it. I, I, <laughs> so oh. that's kind of what I have an eye on. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was a very useful update, James. Um, I will put the link to your to your essays and uh, into the description. People who want to follow you, where's the best place to follow you? Um, go to uh, the American Conservative or the um, American Committee for U.S. Russia Accord, U.S. Russia Accord .org. James Carton, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh -huh.